Mr. President, uh, ladies and gentlemen, friends, colleagues, uh, welcome to this very special event. Uh, 20 years seems like a long time, but it has not been. It's been a very short time uh, in the life of Transparency International. And today is a tremendous opportunity to look back, to see what kind of world we have and are heading into, and what we also should be starting to do uh, for these uh, new or continuing challenges. As all of you know in this room, corruption is one of the world's most talked about problem. As all of us also know, corruption feeds insecurity and conflicts. It drives poverty and inequality. One person in four around the world pays bribes to access essential services, and in some countries, it's two in four who have to pay a bribe. It threatens the trust between the people and their government, as well as the confidence of the leaders in business and other major institutions. This trust being so fundamental for all of us to have well-performing societies. 20 years ago, most governments, international organizations, and multinationals refused to talk about corruption. There were the few codes of conduct, dealing with bribery and conflict of interest, but still fewer compliance teams and anti-corruption reports. Indeed, in the early 90s, far from punishing foreign bribery, as many of you know, the tax system in 14 OECD countries actually counted many bribe payments as deductible business expenses. Only the United States had criminalized foreign business bribery in a law dating back to 1977. So when Transparency International was founded, people were very skeptical. They doubted whether something could be done about corruption. One cartoon portrayed T.I. as Don Quixote tilting at windmills. On the day of T.I.'s launch, the Financial Times said fighting corrupt business practices was like cleaning the Aegean stables. And Transparency International, therefore, has its work cut out for it, said the International Tribune in October 1993. Although it accepted the need to take away some of the mark from international, the Merck rather, from international finance. With 20 years ago, Peter Eigen and a group of individuals who worked very closely with him launched Transparency International, TI, as we know it. This is the story of a vision, a vision held by a group of highly experienced and idealistic people who moved in high circles of international affairs. As they talked, they shared their fears about corruption, their frustration at the failure of their organizations about corruption, and about doing something about it. It became clear that they would not be able to start this new fight within the existing organizations where they were. There were too many vested interests, too great a desire to keep to business as usual because it seemed comfortable at the time. But they wanted to break the conspiracy of silence about corruption because they knew the damage that it did. They wanted to see corruption dealt with. They wanted to see systemic measures put in place to make sure that it would be dealt with wherever it occurred. But the vision began to form, therefore, of a new organization whose overarching purpose would be to fight corruption. Driven by this vision, a small group of people came together in The Hague in the cold winter of 1993, and 10 of them signed the founding charter of Transparency International. Those who participated in that meeting in The Hague included Peter Eigen, Lawrence Cockroft, Peter Conzi, Hans-Jörg Elshorst, Fritz Hyman, Michael Erschmann, K. 
Kamal Hussain, Jerry Parfit, Jeremy Pope, Roy Stacy, and Frank Vogel. Most of them are in this room today. Could I ask you to please rise so that we can applaud you? They took the first steps on a journey which we have all joined since then. For all of them, it was volunteer work, a side, a side activity, but it soon became a commitment that came to define them. Above all, Peter, for whom it cannot have been easy to leave the World Bank, but his time as resident representative in East Africa had left him convinced that the bank's mission and the greater good could not be achieved without tackling corruption head on. Transparency's inaugural conference was held in a place called Villa Borzig here in Berlin. And some people in this room today were at that conference. Again, I would like to ask those of you who were at that inaugural conference to please stand up so that we know who you were. On the agenda was development, the public and private sector perspectives of corruption, the structural nature of corruption, and the solutions and actions that Transparency International could bring. Doesn't it sound familiar even today? In those early days, a range of leaders, Robert McNamara, Devendra Pandey, former President Obazanjo, Dieter Fritsch, Alberto Dahik, Oscar Arias, and many others declared corruption to be universal. It is not just an issue of the South, they said, and fighting it demands concerted action by all of us across the world in partnership under the Transparency International umbrella. And we would not be here today without supporters like Richard von Wetzecker, who is president of Germany. We would not be here without the Global Coalition for Africa, for GTZ and Hans-Jörg Elhorst, Michael Vian, George Moody Stewart, and many more. Those people made it possible for Transparency International to grow. So Peter started Transparency International with barely any cash, no staff, no office, but soon he, uh, soon he found funds to engage Margit von Ham, Frederick Galton as well, who were first uh, staff members. And then Jeremy Pope became the first managing director in 1994. And in partnership with Peter, he made an enormous contribution to the movement in the early years. Sadly, as many of you know, Jeremy passed away last year. Now, Sunday night, we will have the opportunity to celebrate the founders. But for now, let us look at the legacy. The founders were wise. They could have decided to be a think tank or an office with regional offices. But instead, they invented a new and unique third model, grounding Transparency International in national realities through chapters, they also decided to have individual members to give the global perspective and international expertise, as well as an advisory council with world leaders who could be called upon to give their support. The seed they planted has grown strong roots. Transparency International is present today in 112 countries. There are Transparency International accredited chapters in 95 countries with 17 more, either as chapter in formation or contact groups. The movement is further strengthened by 31 individual members who provide a wealth of expertise from various leading roles in business and politics. 
There were thousands of volunteers around the world. And there is a strong secretariat, which has made it possible for TI to expand its work. And I would like uh, to thank the secretariat and its managing director, Kobus de Swart, for all the work that they're doing with us and on our behalf to make many things possible that would not otherwise be. Today, Transparency International is widely recognized as the key driver of global political discourse around the world, as well as the most respected change agent in the countries where we operate. Looking at the diversity in the room today, it is clear that this model has served Transparency International very well over the years. So the founders were very wise in establishing this kind of organization. Many leaders of other organizations have approached me and have asked, how did you ever think of such a model? We only wish we had had the wisdom to do something like this. Today, we dispute that corruption is part of culture, part of a way of life. We dispute that it sometimes needed, is needed to grease the wheels in business deals. We dispute that ordinary people are powerless to do something about it. We say that the bribe giver is as guilty as the bribe taker. But Peter Eigen and the other co-founders never just tilted at windmills. They knew that Transparency International had to build a coalition to make an impact. One of Transparency International's first paper said, TI is focused on initiating constructive actions to bring together in a coalition members of governments, the private sector, and development organizations to join forces against corruption. Now, I'm very pleased today to see a number of representatives from development organizations. It's very, we're very pleased to have all of you with us. This approach was vindicated when 16 European business leaders wrote an open letter calling on OECD governments to tackle corruption, a move that gave great momentum to the OECD Convention Against Bribery. So what Peter and his TI colleagues achieved was to plant their vision in the consciousness of people all over the world, in politics and business, in academia and the media, in power and in daily life. They took an issue that had a devastating impact on the world and were instrumental in making it one of the key social issues of our time. They convinced people that corruption, for many, a mere philosophical concept, could be researched and that they led a political struggle against it. They were successful because they promoted positive values to counter corruption, something that allowed potential allies to believe in a better world. The values of transparency, of accountability, of integrity are now heard every day in public life. So shaping the political discourse on their important has been key. They use tools like the Corruption Perception Index, Integrity Packs, National Integrity System Assessments to make corruption a tangible concept that people could relate to in their struggle in their daily life. Thanks to these tools, TI is today widely recognized as the organization that has led thinking about corruption and efforts to understand and address it. This means that today, when a government promises to fight corruption, the promise must translate in real action. Politicians and business people look at Transparency International to be a driver of social force and provide the tools to practice what is being preached. Je vais en français. En 1996, marque la signature de la Convention interaméricaine au Venezuela. Ce n'était alors qu'un début. D'autres organisations régionales, comme l'Union européenne, le Conseil de l'Europe, l'Union africaine, allaient par la suite suivre cet exemple. Avec la signature de la Convention de l'OCDE contre la corruption en 1997 
et son entrée en vigueur en 1999, les principaux pays industrialisés entreprenaient leur première action d'envergure pour lutter contre la corruption. À ce jour, les 40 États signataires de la Convention représentent deux tiers des exportations mondiales. Il y a dix ans et une semaine, l'Assemblée générale des Nations unies adoptait la Convention des Nations unies contre la corruption. L'adoption de ce texte marque l'avènement d'une norme internationale en plus d'un certain nombre d'engagements contractés par les 168 États l'ayant depuis ratifié, ceci étant évidemment un grand succès à ce jour. En espagnol ha habido una notable proliferación de instituciones y leyes destinadas de forma específica a incrementar la transparencia y la rendición de cuentas. Existen cientos de comisiones anticorrupción, defensorías del pueblo y organismos de auditoría más sólidos, no solo a nivel nacional, sino también en el ámbito regional y organizaciones grandes. Las leyes sobre acceso a la información, que en 1993 solamente habían sido adoptadas en una docena de países, son ahora la norma. La tendencia actual es reconocer el acceso a la información como un derecho y no un privilegio. In 1996, when the World Bank president, James Wilfinson, broke the silence that had shrouded the World Bank with his cancer of corruption speech, he said that people know corruption diverts resources from the poor to the rich and called corruption a major barrier to sound and equitable development. This example today continues. President Kim last week reaffirmed that the bank has a zero tolerance approach to corruption, that fighting corruption is crucial to fighting poverty. And we will hear more from the World Bank this morning. Since Jim Wolfenson transformed the bank, the IMF and the aid community has accepted that our issue are central to attempts to reduce poverty, that good governance is an essential element to dealing with poverty. The International Aid Transparency Initiative, for example, has been widely accepted as a common standard for public disclosure of financial data. 2010, the group of 20 leading economies agreed to an anti-corruption action plan and this was renewed in November 2012 and continues until today. And the implementation of this plan is overseen by an anti-corruption working group, one that Transparency International and civil society as well as business and others have been working with very closely. The UN has also ensured that corruption is part of corporate sustainable efforts by having added corruption to the 10th principle or as the 10th principle of the UN Global Compact, something that TI lobbied extensively to see happen. The UN Global Compact is the world's largest, corp largest corporate governance initiative. It has 8,000 members, 6,000 of these being uh, companies. There are also numerous initiatives uh, around the world which are in place and that drive greater transparency. Under the Extractive Industries Transparency Initiative, a number of countries are now disclosing oil and gas revenues. The World Economic Forum has been the firm ally to TI. Together, we have worked to raise the standards for corporate corruption prevention. And now, 10 years old, the business principles for countering bribery developed by TI remain highly relevant, and they have been updated uh, recently and also uh, some of it was uh, adapted to small and medium-sized enterprises. 
Most recently, the Open Government Partnership was a commitment by 55 governments to open up public data to the people. And here again, civil society organizations have been part of this as recently as last week in London, where many of you were present. Many of you in this room played parts in these major achievements as we look back and have worked hard since to maximize their impact. And there are many more achievements that, of course, we can all add to what I have said. National chapters have given our work local relevance in countries around the world. They understand the specific corruption issues in their communities, develop local solutions that are relevant to daily life. Chapters build local coalitions and engage the people who suffer from corruption. With advocacy and legal advice centers, for example, in 60 countries, making a difference in the lives of the people. Most often, they drive political debate, they drive political campaign for new laws, and with the people, pressure for lasting reform. Our individual members have contributed to the development of global tools and led some of the global initiatives. In this way, TI has been transformed into a major movement. Our impact is so much greater, as is our global credibility, because we have been working together. And that has been a great success. The level of awareness is now about corruption is now universal. Today, people are far more aware than 20 years ago about corruption and its effect on their country's politics, economy, and their own lives. They know that something can be done about it, and they expect their leaders to act. This June, nine people out of 10 said that they are ready to fight corruption. Today, it is harder to get away with abuse of power as public and business leaders are convicted. The place to hide is not as easy to find anymore. Today, corruption is no longer an abstract, an abstract word. People see it for what it is, a global threat that must be fought and one that can be defeated. Friends, we should be proud of the important role that we have played, and we should be proud of what has been happening in the last 20 years to fight corruption. The progress achieved leaves us finally poised to move to the next level. But faced with today's global challenges, we must see the achievements of the last 20 years as a foundation for the next 20. In looking forward, I think we all need to take stock of the world's landscape. As we speak today, population will reach 8.5 billion by 2025. It's a few years from now. And as we approach our 50th anniversary, there will be 9 billion people on the planet. Urban populations are growing rapidly, and cities are under growing pressure to cope with the extra demand for infrastructure and public services. Some of our cities will reach 40 million people within the next decade. Dramatic increases, and of course, this is a great pressure on the infrastructure of the cities. There's dramatic increases of population density will create also pressure on the tolerance of people one for the other. There is rapid industrialization in emerging economies and increased consumer demands. We no longer talk about the BRIC countries because there are many more than those countries emerging. We can already state enormous pressure on, we can already state enormous pressure on the essentials of life, such as food, water, and energy as well as increased pressure on our natural resources. The world remains exposed to the risk of financial crises and lasting economic depression that follow stock market shocks. Our lives will all be changed by climate change and extreme weather conditions. It is already happening. We still live in a world divided by inequality, where the world's richest 10% owns 85% of global wealth and we see unemployment being much too high in many countries, especially youth unemployment, where in certain countries it could be up to 60% and more. All these issues and more 
in this shifting landscape have the potential to exacerbate poverty and conflicts unless we can generate ways to deal with them and the corruption risks that they imply. The Africa Progress uh, Panel has reminded us that resource-rich countries have some of the worst human development indicators in the world. Something to think about. All of these are areas of vulnerability where corruption can prevail. We have laws and rules to respond to these risks, but their enforcement is often very weak. People are on the street, but reforms are not necessarily happening. Commitments are welcomed by leaders of the world, but full implementation sometimes takes a long time to happen, sometimes it does not. So we need to take the public awareness that we have gained over the past 20 years and channel people's anger and cynicism to solutions that will create a change towards greater integrity in our world, greater transparency. We must continue to change not just practices, but value systems. Institutions and businesses need to go beyond mere compliance, circumventing and pushing back. They have to adopt ethical foundations and cultures within their organizations. We need to link our work to the great issues of our time. Friends, let me end by welcoming you once again. I'm so proud to be part of this movement, and I know that all of you share this pride. In looking forward, we still have a massive amount of work to do. If we are here today to celebrate Transparency International and the people who created it, but we are also here to intensify the linkages of our work to the huge issues facing our societies, to see how we can work even to a greater extent with many others who share our views and who work on certain aspects of it and work in coalitions with them. Because of the work done in the last 20 years to make people ready to fight corruption, our work going ahead can make this link. Our discussions today are part of that. Having 2.5 billion people living in poverty is not sustainable, we would all agree. We must link our work to this issue, especially at a time when the post-2015 development agenda is being discussed and we have been contributing uh, to that discussion. It's important to know where we come from, to know where we are going. A number of you were engaged early on and for many years you fought to put our issues on the agenda. Many of our achievements would have been unthinkable two decades ago. So today, we must mobilize similar ambition to face the grave situation our people, our citizens face. We need to maintain the same drive, the same energy, the same determination that drove the founders of Transparency International in its founding charter. The courage to be different and the will to make a difference. Thank you very much. We have received a number of uh, congratulations, uh, one in particular from Yuri Fedodov, who is the executive director of the UN Office of Drugs and Crime. And we have also received a special note from the Secretary General of the United Nations, and with your indulgence, I would like to read it to you. It's a pleasure to congratulate Transparency International on its 20th anniversary. Working in solidarity with other organizations, including the United Nations, you have helped to advance global anti-corruption efforts in developed and developing countries alike. Corruption should no longer be seen as the regrettable price of doing business. It is a crime that must be rejected. From street corners to corporate boardrooms, many billions of dollars are lost annually to corruption. The impact from arms smuggling and human trafficking to the trade in endangered species and the bribes that undermine governance and the rule of law is devastating and corrosive. The international community has strengthened its efforts to help victims and create a climate of trust, transparency, and accountability. 
The UN Convention Against Corruption now has 168 parties, and the Stolen Asset Recovery Initiative, a UN World Bank partnership, is striving to close the sanctuaries used by unscrupulous leaders and others. The business community has a clear role to play in delivering the message that anti-corruption efforts are not an onerous duty, but rather an opportunity for renewal of lost credibility and damaged reputations. The UN, for its part, operates in some of the world's most dangerous and unstable environments. As a result, we face multifaceted corruption risks that can undermine our efforts to advance development, peace, and human rights. There are also vulnerabilities within the organization, as with any large enterprise, such as ours. And we have developed a robust system of international control to respond to it. We continue to remain vigilant and work hard to address these challenges and to set an example of integrity for the people we serve. Congratulations again on your 20th anniversary. I look forward to continuing our shared efforts to rid the world of corruption. Ban Ki-moon. So I would like to express your appreciation to the Secretary General for that. I would now like to ask Peter Eigen to come to the podium. Mr. President, <laughs> dear friends, it is an amazing and emotional experience to stand in front of such a fantastic group from all over the world coming together combined with a thought of uh, creating a better world, fighting poverty, fighting injustice, fighting violence, by fighting corruption. So thank you very, very much for being here, and thank you uh, for allowing me to, to address you. Um, in fact, thank you very much, uh, Huguette Labelle, for the tour d'horizon you have already performed about the 20 years which are behind us. I think uh, you captured basically the reality of uh, our movement and of what we have done so what can I do? Um, I would like to, uh, if you allow me to, uh, select one particular issue, one particular um, approach which uh, Transparency International has used in order to uh, become successful. And I would like to also select one particular person and the contribution of that person as passport toto uh, to honor all the many people who have been partly mentioned by you, Huguette uh, Labelle, and uh, whom we are going to honor during the course of this annual meeting. The issue I would like to talk about and select from the huge bouquet of uh, instruments and tools and approaches which Transparency International has developed is um, what is now called collective action, which sounds extremely um, simple, banal, or what we called in the beginning, in the, beginning uh, the island of integrity, the creation of a relevant market within which one tries to have a collective um, reform where everybody agrees on a level playing field to behave better, in particular in our case to stop bribing. So this is what I would like to talk about uh, and I would like to trace its history basically through the 20 years or even before um, as it uh, made it possible for our movement to make so much progress. It started basically when I was uh, still the director of the World Bank office in Nairobi and I heard many companies from various parts of the world complaining about the systemic corruption they were facing in the countries for which I was responsible for the World Bank. So I thought if they all complain about it, why don't I take them by their word and ask them to stop and make sure that they all stop at the same time and get their agreement to be monitored about the um, termination of this terrible practice, which I had observed myself 
uh, in my role in East Africa. So I called this um, the business practice monitor, an agreement with all the business leaders to stop bribing and then simply have it monitored and everybody would uh, be clean in the future and everybody could f compete in a functioning market with uh, quality, with price, with reliability of delivery and so on, uh, and uh, didn't have to compete um, in the murky area of, uh, of corruption. But I noticed very quickly that um, this was a dream. I was supported by quite a number of people, and I would like to mention a few people as I speak. I mean, for instance, the father of John Githongu, Joe Githongu, with whom I had regular meetings in, um, in the uh, Red Bull, a uh, wonderful uh, restaurant in Nairobi. Um, he was absolutely excited about this idea of creating this business practice monitor. Um, his son, Jogi Songu, was still at the university, but he also had shining eyes when I told them about it. I also told uh, visiting um, representatives of the donor community. I remember uh, at the time uh, Linda Chalker came and um, Tim Lancaster from um, DFID, or it was at the time it was called ODA, and they said it would be wonderful if you could put something like that in place. Uh, people came from Germany, Hans-Jörg Elshorst, who was at the time the head of the GTZ, uh, he said, great, if you can introduce a system like this. So I started to work on this, but uh, as you probably all know, I was uh, very quickly told by the legal department of the World Bank that this was not allowed, that uh, fighting corruption was uh, meddling in the domestic affairs of our partner countries, and that therefore I had to stop immediately uh, doing this kind of um, naive and unprofessional work. So to make a long story short, I uh, left the bank and um, continued to promote this idea of simultaneous collective action of those who were both the victims and the perpetrators of corruption. I was invited by, in, at the time in particular, the uh, Global Coalition for Africa, Jan Prong, Robert McNamara, President Obasanjo, um, uh, a number of powerful people who organized conferences all over Africa in order to address what at that time was already recognized as being one of the great obstacles to African development, poor governance. And um, eventually then, of course, we reached the time when we presented this here in Berlin in 1993 after many conferences with this group of founders who had uh, together um, uh, signed the founding document which we saw uh, on the screen earlier um, in uh, the office of Jan Pronk in The Hague. I remember when I told um, Robert McNamara about this approach, he was electrified. He said, I, as president of the World Bank, I uh, did not dare to tackle corruption because uh, I knew that many members of my board, many, many members of the World Bank, allowed corruption, explicitly allowed corruption uh, for their companies uh, trying to do business outside their borders. But the idea of collective action, doing this at the same time, looked to him like a squaring of the circle, uh, the achievement of the magic of uh, uh, trying to do the right thing at the same time. And so when I invited him to come to our launch conference in Berlin in 1993, he said, I'm coming, but only if uh, you find one representative of a company, one representative of a government, and, well, perhaps you can be the representative of civil society who commit themselves to promote this idea of having this, what we call, integrity pact, to creating this island of integrity um, in, in a... Um, uh, binding uh, way. And I found these people. I found uh, uh, Fritz Heimann, who is sitting here among us, who uh, worked for a very small company in, in the United States for General Electric. He said, uh, we are going to participate in trying to get this kind of um, uh, deal uh, going. We had a vice president of uh, a Latin American country, uh, Alberto Dajic uh, of uh, Ecuador, who said, I'm going to do this in my country. 
we are going to introduce exactly this integrity pact for our next large procurement uh, programs. And of course, we, uh, the founders of Transparency International, we all said we are going to work very hard for that. So McNamara, who walked with, uh, uh, with uh, Frank Vogel and me through the Brandenburg Gate, who was very touched by uh, seeing that the wall had come down, uh, he um, was very emotional. He said, uh, this is wonderful, count me in. In fact, if you uh, manage to get one of these deals, one of these triangular arrangements uh, going in one in mid-sized country, it cannot be a very small country, it has to be a major country, I'm going to give you $10,000 out of my own pocket to finance Transparency International. So and uh, Frank and I, I think we were exposed to McNamara's uh, inquiry every couple of weeks, you know, have you got one? And uh, we had to tell him, just wait. Uh, and eventually, uh, he didn't give us the $10,000 because it became so overwhelming and so many countries participated in this approach. So I think this idea of um, finding some understanding with the companies which had been used over many, many years to bribe systematically outside their countries in order to get uh, contracts, uh, to um, have some, not sympathy, but some understanding for their difficulty to stop bribing from one day to the other everywhere in the world, uh, was extremely important to uh, make progress. And, um, and I think this is uh, what helped us eventually to bring the business community not only in the United States, where, of course, they had an interest in promoting uh, what um, the Foreign Corrupt Practices Act had already done several years earlier, but also in Europe, uh, brought us to this breakthrough. In fact, we told them we will find for you relevant situations in which you have active competition with uh, a known number of competitors, say a World Bank project where only about 10 uh, large companies are bidding for a infrastructure project, are pre-qualified to bid. So we will go to the other nine and tell them to stop bribing if you join us. And we will put in place a monitoring system, possibly with a TI chapter, possibly with another third party, which is independent and credible. And uh, on that basis, uh, some of the companies began to find interest, in particular those companies which know that they are providing good quality and good price and reliable delivery, and therefore, uh, for them, a corruption-free international market would be much more uh, suitable than one in which they had to, to bribe. Now, we reached that point in uh, 1994, 1995, and uh, we began to support a OECD effort to create a recommendation to the ministers of the participating member countries of the OECD uh, to do something against foreign bribery of their nationals. And it was at that point where we then began to invite in Germany, in Switzerland, in other German-speaking countries, um, the leaders of uh, the business community to explain to them the benefits of a corruption-free market. We found some business leaders who were clean from the very beginning. I remember Markus Bierig of, uh, of the Bosch company, for instance. He said, we never bribe. And if somebody demands money from us, we immediately close shop. But others said, what we are doing in these other countries uh, may be called bribery if we do it in Germany or in the UK, but it is not bribery in Indonesia. In fact, it's normal business practice and therefore we should not impose our European uh, values on these uh, other uh, cultures. Well, uh, Uget mentioned this, uh, this excuse of different cultures uh, permitting and demanding uh, corruption has been rejected by us. So we began to invite them, and in fact, I have to say, we got some support uh, from um, two leaders of the German Big Business uh, uh, Association of the BDE. Uh, we got uh, Mr. von Wartenberg and, and Mr. Henkel, Olaf Henkel, uh, who had worked for IBM and therefore had some familiarity with the American Foreign Corrupt Practices Act. And they helped us to find the right people in the business community to invite them to a meeting. 
but they didn't dare to come to the meeting because uh, they were afraid that we, as a civil society organization, we would embarrass them, we would uh, disclose what is being discussed, we would not stick to sort of the Chatham House room, rules which I had offered. And uh, it took quite some time until we got enough people who were willing to come, and the breakthrough came when the former president of Germany, federal president Richard von Weizsäcker, who had just ended his term as president, when he said, I'm going to chair this meeting. I will make sure that everybody concerned can have confidence that this will be professional, that this will be, um, will have integrity the meeting, and it will not be abused by any participants. So I remember how uh, uh, Michael Wien, who was one of the people preparing the meetings at the Aspen Institute, how delighted we were. And uh, Mr. President, you helped us to break through this wall, which we uh, would not have been able to do uh, without this contribution. And <laughs> now what happened afterwards was that in after th three meetings, uh, and the first ones were not very pleasant. In fact, I remember seeing Richard von Weizsäcker extremely angry at some of the uh, claims of uh, the business community. We had Siemens there, we had RBB there, we had Lufthansa there, we had Daimler there, we had uh, Schering. Uh, we had really the most powerful uh, business uh, community assembled at the Aspen Institute. Um, when they claimed what we are doing is normal practice in these other countries. It is very harmful, it is damaging, it distorts uh, economic decision making and business, and it also damages, of course, our honest competitors. Um, but it's not corruption. And I remember this became a very unpleasant and unfriendly meeting. But after three meetings, we managed to get an open letter signed by these 16 uh, uh, big shots of German uh, and Swiss and, and Austrian business uh, to the government at the time, uh, to the government of Helmut Kohl and uh, Minister Rexroth, demanding that they not only support the ongoing OECD exercise for a recommendation of stopping bribery, but demanding that this should become a, a binding convention, because the Germans are always afraid of um, uh, sort of uh, peer reviews and being put under pressure by the Americans, for instance, uh, as we can witness nowadays also. So uh, this open letter, in my opinion, was the breakthrough. The OECD Convention of 1997 would never have been signed if the Germans wouldn't have participated. Um, Pascal Lamy will, uh, will clearly agree with me that the French wouldn't have signed if the Germans wouldn't have signed. In fact, the French tried at the time to introduce a grandfather clause so that at least all corrupt deals which had already been uh, concluded could be completed. Uh, we're not subject to the new uh, standards of the uh, of the OECD convention and uh, and of course the French chapter managed to uh, eliminate this uh, reservation of uh, of the French government and the same thing is true with the UK with uh, in fact some of the signatory states still are not fully enforcing uh, the the rules of the OECD convention but i must say germany is doing quite well about 120 uh, companies are um, under criminal investigation in Germany, which is an amazing feat because uh, uh, I think in Germany this has really been internalized and is being implemented. So uh, this is why I uh, would like to single out this idea of collective action, of uh, trying to get um, simultaneous improvement of uh, uh, of conduct in the international marketplace because we don't have uh, proper and effective regulation of the international uh, market. And therefore we need this kind of approach in which um, through cooperation between companies, civil society, and the governments, um, an improvement of uh, the international governance can be achieved, not only in fighting corruption, but also in the area of uh, other failing governance um, the situations in human rights and labor conditions, environment, and so on. And of course, uh, the willingness of uh, 
uh, Richard von Weizsäcker to come into this minefield and uh, give us his name in order to bring about this uh, change in the attitude of German business is typical for uh, not only his approach and support for the public good, but also the support of public good of so many people who have been part of, uh, of our movement. And it is in this context, therefore, that I would like uh, to convey on President von Weizsäcker something which we have created for this 20th anniversary, which is a, a, uh, a pin of honor, uh, which, uh, which we will hand out to the other participants who are here, um, who have been in a similar uh, contributing role as uh, Richard von Weizsäcker. But um, I would like to honor him representing this wonderful group of uh, supporters, which has made it possible for all of us uh, to achieve what we have achieved. So thank you very much. And uh, if I may, I want to stick this on you, Mr. van Rijtenegger. Yes, it might. This is not very important what I have to say. <laughs> Thank you very much. I simply want to say once more, uh, corruption is a temptation for people who lead business in poor countries. And to find out that this kind of temptation Combine, combining personal gains and political difficulty, difficulties has to be fought together. And looking at this gathering here, I'm so happy that you all of you have to fight the same battle which Peter Eigen has started in my country. Mm -hmm. And this is why I have nothing else to say but to thank all of you that you are opening our eyes to understand that corruption is going in the wrong direction if you want really to have success back home, even personal success. So thank you all of you. And this is why I am very proud that you gather once more here in the city of Berlin to exchange your experiences and to go ahead with Transparency International. Peter, it's your work started here. And all of you, all of your colleagues do the same thing and please greet the political leaders in other countries and invite them to do more for what you are doing so well for the rest of the world and especially for the poor parts of the world. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Mr. President, for such inspiring remarks, and thank you to Peter and Higet for all of the hard work that you've put in over so many years. We now move on to Leonard McCarthy, who's the Vice President for Integrity at the World Bank. Please.
Thank you very much. Uh, you get you people really do things in style here in Berlin, I must say. Um, thank you for that uh, fascinating history by you and uh, and Peter Eigen. Um, and Mr. President, if I if I had you in South Africa, I would have said Amanda. So you 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 really moved us. Um, yeah, the, the the history is fascinating uh, because it is both a a teachable moment. Um, it's a time to celebrate and congratulate TI, and at the same time, an uh, 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 opportune occasion to reflect a little. For those of you who, who are not from this great city of Berlin, uh, there's great irony uh, in the fact that, uh, that they are hosting an event on transparency in a building that has a history of being both a popular meeting point for black market and espionage activity. <laughs> uh, I thought I should share that with you. You know, those of you who are into uh, intelligence gathering and all these funny things. Um, but coming back to the TI founders, uh, you get, I was also pleased to see the list of the nine people who signed uh, uh, the initial charter because I don't know how many of you have met people who claim to have been at that meeting. Uh, I think I've met about 50. I now know there was only nine. Um, but you were very courageous, uh, uh, and, uh, and uh, you must have had very iconoclastic thoughts, um, TI's founders, 20 years ago. Your brains must have been wired like that of a certain... Uh, former judge president of the New South Wales Courts of Appeal. Uh, you know judges are interesting phenomena. Uh, and you must always defer to a judge and listen to them. So this judge spoke to some lawyers and he, uh, he was very much in favor of opening up the, the local standi of ordinary people to have access to the courts. And some of the lawyers asked him, but will that not open the floodgates um, and the courts will, be, will become unmanageable? And uh, the Chief Justice listened to all of us and just looked around and in an offbeat remark he said, uh, maybe if we open the floodgates, we would irrigate the arid land below us. And so TI, you have sensibly opened up the floodgates the last 20 years to irrigate the land below us. And I must really congratulate you with that. Uh, someone asked me before I came here, what brought TI into this quintessential space where they are the supreme authority? And uh, having listened to all of you today, I can only confirm that it has something to do with the unquestionable integrity of your leadership. Uh, it is for that reason that you could encourage many of us to do our jobs and despite our limitations and our, uh, our mistakes, and you could offer support where no one else would stand up, uh, and you could be the fearless, the fearless advocate and voice uh, coming to the defense of, of people like no one else. Um, TI has opened our eyes. Uh, you have had a ubiquitous presence in all things corruption. Uh, one thing I've learned over the years is that TI is always watching. You know, TI is always watching, almost like the NSA. <laughs> they <laughs> they're not afraid to criticize or question, uh, and they do not dance around the word corruption. I don't know how many events you've been to where people use the word governance. And I say, but my mother doesn't understand that word. Just call it corruption. Uh, I saw uh, with great interest that last uh, Recently, you put pressure on multinationals in emerging markets to use their growing influence to stop corruption. And, uh, and uh, last month, you questioned why the Moroccan authorities banned the screening of a documentary on corruption. Very few people would do that. Very few institutions would do that because we are all so civilized and we don't want to offend others. Now, the World Bank, who is your twin partner, uh, Peter, Peter, the World Bank. Peter, uh, when you come back, where, where's Peter? 
when you come back, I can assure you that the legal department will not tell you to stop meddling in the affairs of countries. Uh, if anything, we will give you a Lifetime Achievement Award because you've changed the world. Let's give Peter another round of applause again. Uh, Matia is also uh, so well tuned in to know when to extend praise to others, um, when to be critical and when to be constructively supportive. I remember that uh, when I came to the World Bank, there were a number of cases that uh, where some institutions and companies seemed untouchable. And, uh, and, um, and so we started investigating cases against Siemens, against Alstom, uh, and against SNC Loveland. And when we took action against them, TI was always the soundboard for the public to judge the equity of what we've been doing. At the same time, uh, TI was defending the public's interest in the way we deal with these matters. And so it is uh, in, in no small part thanks to TI's support that we today say we have a zero tolerance approach to corruption when it affects World Bank projects uh, and activities we fund. Now, Peter will tell you that even that debate uh, has taken time to sink in because some people seem to think that 5% of corruption is okay, 7%, 10%, and you're going down a, a road of no return because tomorrow it's 30% and then it's 60%. Um, and I think we could all help this movement by making sure that there's a clear message to say that we don't tolerate corruption. doesn't mean that we, we are on a crusade all the time. We use a graduated response when we react but we have a zero tolerance approach. Otherwise, we're in big trouble. I also remember that in 2007, after Paul Volcker did a review of the World Bank's anti-corruption arsenal, TI came out with a four-page statement in which they fearlessly supported the panel's findings. Uh, they insisted that the office that I had stays independent. They injected rigor into our investigative procedures and they felt very strongly that the World Bank should mine investigations for lessons learned that could improve bank projects and prevent corruption. They were the, the, the signature post at the time in terms of dealing with this inquiry. Transparency International uh, has also helped publicize our initiatives such as cross-debarment amongst the international financial institutions, uh, uh, whereby we agree to honor one another's debarment decision. Uh, and they did that as they continue to urge the world actors to unravel corruption. Every now and then I would call TI and say, well, what do you think about this? Uh, do you think you can issue a statement on this matter? We also uh, established something in Washington, and it sounds like something from a James Bond movie, but it's not. Uh, it's called the World Bank's International Corruption Hunters Alliance. Uh, and, and, and one of the hunters, I will not mention the country, when he heard about this event, sent me an email and he said, Mr. McCarthy, why are they uh, celebrating and uh, commemorating 20 years of their existence? I hope they're not thinking of closing down. So um, I said, no, 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 no. They, uh, they're actually thinking about what they're going to tackle in the next 20 years. But when you get was there, there were about 200 and 86 directors of public prosecutions, heads of anti-corruption agencies, and other anti-corruption experts. And she prodded them to take action. And she said, you are sitting here, many of you are under pressure with your governments, many of them don't have the stomach to stand up, many of them don't have the political will, but she was appealing to something else. Uh, she also took a very interesting view about the importance of setting up escrow accounts to secure the interest on money and assets tied up in preservation and freezing orders. Now, we haven't done that, but I think it's an excellent idea. And as part of your, your existence for the next 20 years, I would really urge TI to think of setting up an anti-corruption fund so that we can all, all of us, put money into that fund so that that money can go back to the poor people who carry the brunt of corruption. Um, you get is, 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 is well respected uh, and very welcome at the bank, so please bring Peter along next time when you come. 
but she came in July to speak to World Bank staff, uh, investigators, analysts, uh, litigation experts, and she had a very interesting statement. She said, you have to do the right thing when you deal with corruption. Uh, and ignoring uh, doing the right thing is the same as being complicit to crime or an accessory after the fact. Uh, as she put it more vividly, she said, when you put your fingers in the meat grinder of corruption, the whole body goes. The whole body goes. Uh, she also said something that I that sort of keep on reflecting on. She said, when you look at issues like poverty, social destabilization, violence, illicit trade, money laundering, uh, crumbling infrastructure, or lack of it, all may not be due to corruption, but corruption is a common denominator to all of them. Um, I have a 13-year-old son, and uh, you know, you can't lie to children, you've got to be honest with them. And he asked me the other day how bad it is, and I said, I suspect that if you take the average 10 people from every country, and you ask them what is it that's holding their countries back most, six out of 10 will say it's corruption. Now, 12 years ago, TI, on the 7th of October, gave an integrity award to someone called Eva Jolie for her contribution to the fight against corruption, for the example that she set to others, and for her fearlessness in the face of political danger. Eva Jolie never wanted to lose an opportunity to push the envelope, accepted the award, but then continued to suggest that TI's Corruption Perception Index should highlight the abuse of tax havens in facilitating corruption. That's Ava. That's Ava. Well, we've come a long way since then, but in the spirit, in the Ava spirit, I'd like to, to point out uh, four or five more things that I, I thought TI yeah, should consider for the, next, uh, for the next 20 years of your life. You will have noticed that there's a growing trend amongst developed countries, the so-called part ones, who seek transparency of, of assets that were generated on their soil but invested offshore, ex extraterritorially. Now, much of the work that they are doing focuses on catching tax evasion. There are many accords being signed and everyone's talking about a, to a, sort of a totally different landscape. This also, I suspect, will have a major impact on highly corrupt officials. So I think if TI can just hang on to the coattails of this current uh, 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 lorry going down the road on tax evasion and uh, international transparency from uh, developed countries, you are going to discover a minefield. Um, recently, prosecutors in Paris opened a preliminary investigation into allegations that Bashar al-Assad's uncle illegally bought 160 million um, euros worth of property in France. Uh, similar investigations have examined assets held by rulers or their associates in Gabon, Equatorial Guinea, Congo, Brazzaville, Egypt, Tunisia, and Libya. I think there's a lot of, there's a minefield there waiting for TI to explore. So help us do this uh, and help us get it right uh, and if I dare say, I think the world needs more public interest litigation. Those people who, who feel that they can and should support TI because of their moral consciousness, uh, as far as funding is concerned, uh, enable them to do this kind of thing because I think it's important. Uh, secondly, uh, as part of your next 20 year cycle, I really think TI can push service providers uh, and regulators to make offshore financial records public, uh, as well as property records and agency fees paid in jurisdictions where corrupt officials are commonly known to hide their assets. Uh, and those of us who have worked with many of these offshore jurisdictions, we shouldn't treat them all like the devil. Uh, I've met many attorney generals and other people uh, where they, they really want to change the game and they can work with us. Uh, I've done an investigation previously where I got quicker reaction from Guernsey and from the BVI than I got from the United Kingdom. So let's, let's avoid the stereotyping. Uh, I think it's, it's how you engage with people if you want to get things done. 
Um, this will help expose the true face of corruption and generate uh, a moral revulsion amongst the public. And at the same time, it will create a deterrent for politicians to steal wealth. Uh, the business world is also very, very important. And I have been one of the people who are a little bit cynical about the, the uh, statements by, by many uh, uh, business people, especially when their companies are in trouble. But I've had a Damascus moment. I've, I've changed my mind. And, uh, and uh, if you think about it, the, the business world has been in the eye of the storm for the last five years. But if you analyze the critical components of corruption, we will come to the conclusion that they are one of five solution components. Uh, and they are able to help us resolve corruption. The business world has been at the heart of the innovations and the developments that we've seen uh, in our society today. They're very, very smart people. I actually think they could help us build effective governments to restore public trust. Um, I think if we appeal to them to make social responsibility of their companies count in the frontiers of society that are most afflicted by corruption and poverty, if we get them, as Peter Eigen has said, all of them to say no and do it at the same time, I think we can change the world. And then something more radical before you throw me out of here. I, I really think we should select 20 countries where there's a, the winds of change are blowing through that country. You could see it. There's a swing in the pendulum. There's a change in calculus. Some people, some governments and some heads of states have campaigned on a ticket of anti-corruption. Hold people accountable. I, I actually think if we go and analyze all the statements made by governments in the last three years and we go and say, Mr. President, you said so, and you just ask for, tell us where you are with this, it'll keep you busy for the next 30 years. Um, but I, I think if we could work side by side with reform-minded uh, officials, and there are many around the world, and a progressive public, we can help to turn things around. TI has the gravitas, the independence, and the credibility to lead such, a, such an initiative. And the World Bank's technical and financial resources would be an ideal complement. But it doesn't mean I have money in a fund, but you can always come and talk to me about that. But I think with this kind of collective action, we can, uh, as the pre bank's president often says, bend the arc of history. Uh, people are now talking about ending and eradicating extreme poverty in our lifetime. Let's also commit to end and eradicate extreme corruption in our lifetime. So that instead of reading about countries uh, in which corruption has caused a complete collapse, we can usher in a new era of integrity. Peter, I commend you for your vision in 1993. You and the other eight or nine stalwarts that gave life to TI were ahead of your time. Uh, your idea became a movement. TI is a brand that resonates in the subconscious mind of people around the world. Even my mother in the township in South Africa knows about you. So please make the next 20 years about securing a corrupt free world. Thank you very much.